everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Today we're going to be talking about obstetrical emergencies, everybody's favorite topic. So, I think pregnant patients are scary. It's kind of funny to me that uh, we can see the worst trauma, the bloodiest mess, the biggest heart attack, you name it, emergency, in the emergency department we can handle it, but the minute a pregnant lady walks in, everybody freaks out. So, if you're scared of pregnant patients, just know that you're not alone. Hopefully... After this talk, we'll all be a little bit more comfortable with things to think about and how to handle these patients. I think one of the things that makes them a little bit scary is you have two patients, essentially, right? And one of them you can't see, and we're all visual assessors. That's what we do, and if we have a patient we can't see, that makes it even harder. So let's try to make that a little easier. One of the things to think about in pregnancy with the the patient that you can see is how much is going on in this lady's body physiologically. The changes of pregnancy are pretty incredible. To start with, when you think about the pregnant lady's heart, her cardiac output increases up to 40% and she's almost got a 50% increase in her circulating blood volume. And not only that, but clotting factors increase because she's getting ready to give birth, but that can lead her to being a little more prone to clotting, which is important to think about pulmonary embolisms in these patients in the right setting. I think this is fascinating because cardiologically in pregnant females, they're essentially in high output heart failure for nine months and their body handles it just fine. And this happens all the time, but it just kind of blows my mind when I stop to think about what's going on with them and their heart. So when we think about the lungs in pregnancy, they have to have more oxygen to help with this developing fetus. So they're going to have increased tidal volumes, but because of the increased growing in the abdomen, there's going to be less residual capacity in the lungs. They're pushed up into her chest. So even though her tidal volumes are higher, she's going to have less residual capacity, which leads to increased respiratory rate and higher in tidals. In terms of the kidneys, there's going to be increased glomerular filtration, which leads to frequent urination. And if you actually, so the kidneys are not only working harder to process all of this increased blood volume, and they're seeing more need for filtration, but if you look at this little baby right here, his head is just bouncing right on top of that bladder right there. So she's got constant pressure on the bladder. So any of you who have had interactions with pregnant females before know that they frequently have to urinate, and that's why. So her metabolism is really amped up, trying to help develop this growing baby. There's going to be a 20% increase in oxygen demand. The metabolic rate is going to be high. She's going to need more caloric intake, and she's also going to have higher needs for iron and for folate for development of that embryo. GI symptoms can be pretty frequent in pregnant females. If you look at how much room that baby is taking up in her abdomen, she's going to have decreased gastric emptying just by function of space. There's going to be slowed gastric motility, and pretty much 9 out of 10 women are going to have GERD as a consequence of that stomach and the stomach contents being pushed up into the esophagus. Not only that, but the esophageal sphincter is relaxed as well, which also can complicate GERD in pregnancy. So when you're assessing your pregnant females, it's important to get history. I always like to ask gestational age so you know if you're going to have to deliver this baby, what things you need to think about. How many times has she been pregnant before? What kind of prenatal care has she had? Any known complications that would include diabetes, preeclampsia, ruptured membranes, thyroid problems can be pretty frequent in pregnancy. So these are all things to think about and are going to help guide your management. G's and P's can be difficult for people to remember. The way I remember G's and P's, it's just a quick way to tell how many times the lady's been pregnant and how many times she's actually delivered. I remember the P first, para, sounds like parent in my head, so that helps me remember that that is the number of live births that she has had after 20 weeks gestation. And then gravida is just the number of pregnancies that she's ever had. So if you're thinking about a female and you hear that she's G3P2, that means she's had three pregnancies and two births. Now, this could indicate a couple of things. One could be that she's currently pregnant with baby number three, right? And she's delivered two, which is probably most common. Or sometimes it could indicate that she's had a miscarriage before and, it, and has only carried two to delivery. So it's important to clarify. But that's what G's and P's stand for.
Every time I'm approaching a pregnant female who might be having an impending delivery, these are four important questions that help you kind of determine how fast you're going to need to act. Number one is, is her water broken? Has she felt a rush of fluid? Is she having any bleeding? This what could indicate an obstetrical emergency. Is she feeling fetal movement? Typically with fetal movement, most ladies can feel this after about 20 weeks gestation. Sometimes if they're in their first pregnancy, they might be feeling it, but just not recognize it yet. But most ladies after about 20 weeks will be able to tell you whether or not they're feeling the movement. And then you want to ask about contractions. How close are they? How long are they? How strong are they? And that can indicate how soon this delivery might happen. In terms of contractions, throughout the course of delivery, they're going to increase in frequency and severity. And the whole purpose behind contractions in a baby that's in the correct position to be delivered, which we call vertex, which is essentially with the head down so that the head comes out first. With each contraction is that baby's head is pushed against the cervix, which is the lower part of the uterus. That cervix starts to dilate and starts to thin out and then ultimately open up so the head can be delivered and then the rest of the baby's body. And so that's the whole point of contractions is to start to thin out and open up that cervix for ultimate delivery. And you can tell usually if there's going to be an imminent delivery if mom tells you she feels the need to push. And that's when you're kind of clued in to look for crowning and assess for imminent delivery or not. So if you have a mom who's had no prenatal care but is telling you she's having frequent contractions and is feeling the need to push and you just don't know how far along this baby's going to be and whether or not you need to anticipate a preterm infant, you can use something called fundal height assessment to check about gestational age. And essentially what you do is you can measure from the top of the pubic symphysis, the bone right here at the, at the pelvic inlet, all the way across the abdomen until you feel the top of the uterus. And that's usually pretty easily palpable in a, in a gravid female. And you can assess if you have a way to measure each centimeter is going to be a week of pregnancy. So if you have someone who's measuring from the pubic bone to the top of the uterus about 35, that would indicate you have about a 35 week gestation. And if you are assessing a pregnant female and she doesn't know if you have a uterus that's palpable just about the level of the belly button, that would indicate she's just about 20 weeks. So it's a, a nice little tool to know about for assessment in a lady who has had no prenatal care and you're trying to figure out what you're dealing with. Ectopic pregnancy is an important thing to think about early in pregnancy or really in any female or childbearing age. You need to think about this in any lady with vaginal bleeding, severe pelvic pain, or even syncopal episodes. It's a pregnancy that occurs outside the uterus in an abnormal position and as that embryo starts to grow can start to hemorrhage vessels around it and lead to life-threatening bleeding. So very important to ask about last menstrual periods, um, previous history of ectopic or previous history of sexually transmitted diseases, especially pelvic inflammatory disease that can lead to scarring and higher risk for this type of pregnancy. Also in your early pregnant patients, it's important to think about miscarriage. We get called to a lot of 24 alphas or bravos where there's a significant amount of vaginal bleeding and cramping early in pregnancy. It's important to realize that miscarriages, people don't really talk about them, but they happen in almost one out of four pregnancies. Usually they happen in the first trimester, usually within the first couple of months, and this is due to a chromosomal or genetic abnormality that would be incompatible with life. They tend to present with vaginal bleeding and cramping. Sometimes the, the lady will pass some tissue or some large clots. It's not always easily identifiable, but depending how far along in the pregnancy it might be. It's important to just, with these patients, realize that this is a very emotional process and just try to slow down with them, be gentle, be compassionate. There's a lot of, a lot of things going on here and just try to be kind because this, be, this can be a big deal for people. Another thing that can occur usually early in pregnancy but can actually occur throughout the pregnancy is hyperemesis gravidarum. The way this is diagnosed is if the lady is having three or more episodes of vomiting per day that's leading to weight loss 
and ketones in her urine. There's a really high risk for dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, and malnutrition. Sometimes these ladies need to be admitted to the hospital to get their electrolytes repleted and actually get their nourishment through an IV because they're just not able to keep any food down. And we already talked about their increased metabolic requirements, so it's important that they're getting the iron and the vitamins and all the calories that they need to help that developing baby. If you find yourself responding to a lady who is having a significant amount of vomiting and you suspect this, make sure you get a 12 lead and check her QT interval before you give her Zofran. Just realize that with the vomiting, she can become hypokalemic, and if you add Zofran on top of that, that might put her at higher risk for arrhythmias. Really the important thing with these ladies is to give fluids and give Zofran if you think it's indicated. Another thing that can be pretty helpful we'll talk about a little bit later, but is to have her sniff an alcohol pad. There's been studies that show that sniffing, sniffing those pads go right to those osmotic receptors in the brain and somehow help with nausea. So I like to do that for these ladies as well. As you're getting your history and you're asking about rupture of membranes, realize that they can rupture spontaneously even if the lady is not in labor. This can be a really big deal because it might lead to premature birth. Sometimes if the if it's too early, that cord can prolapse and present first if it's not in that nice, sterile, closed environment. And really the big danger with premature rupture of membranes would be infection because now you're taking a sterile environment that's now open to the external environment and bad things can get in and infect the baby and also infect mom's uterus. So important to ask about whether or not there's been a rush of fluid. And in preterm bursts, this is actually a pretty common cause of that if the membranes rupture too early. Preeclampsia is another thing to assess for. Sometimes they'll be able to tell you that they have this. Sometimes they'll already be on blood pressure medication. But if you see a lady who's got a blood pressure of 140 over 90 on one occasion with either headache, blurry vision, altered mental status, any other symptom that would indicate preeclampsia, I would go ahead and treat with magnesium. Also, if she's got a one-time blood pressure greater than 160 systolic or 110 diastolic, go ahead and treat that with magnesium as well. Realize other associated symptoms with preeclampsia would be headaches, vision changes, sometimes edema, but that could go with just normal pregnancy. And then shortness of breath can go with normal pregnancy as well. So take the entire picture that your patient is painting for you and try to do a good assessment there. Preeclampsia becomes very dangerous when it leads to eclampsia, and this is when she actually has a seizure from her blood pressure being too high. It's very important here to realize that these seizures and this preeclampsia can occur up to 12 weeks after delivery. So if you have a lady who's no longer pregnant but recently delivered and she's hypertensive, consider preeclampsia and eclampsia to still be a problem that you might need to treat. So just like with any seizure, you're going to treat with Versed first to stop the seizure, but in the right clinical context with the lady who's either, either pregnant or has recently delivered, you're going to want to give magnesium as well. Another obstetrical emergency to think about would be placenta previa. This is where the placenta is actually overlying the cervical opening. This is usually diagnosed on ultrasound, and most ladies will know when they have it. Throughout the pregnancy, sometimes it'll grow and move off to the side, but sometimes it stays and covers the opening, in which case the lady might need a C-section to deliver the baby. If she hasn't had any prenatal care and she is full term and the baby's trying to deliver through the placenta, that can cause a lot of vaginal bleeding that's life-threatening for the baby and can also be life-threatening for mom. That placenta is an incredibly vascular organ, and if it starts to tear or to rupture, as the delivery process starts to ensue, it can lead to some pretty significant bleeding. It's important to realize this is usually painless. Whereas when you're thinking about placental abruption, this is painful bleeding. And this is usually due to trauma in a fairly late term pregnancy. It's where the placenta actually physically tears away from the uterus. And you know that that placenta is very vascular and there can be usually a contained blood clot inside the abdomen. Sometimes there's vaginal bleeding, but more often than not, there isn't. It's just a painful abdomen with vital signs that would suggest some instability and some bleeding. It's important to think about the context of her history here too, because this tends to happen after some trauma to the abdomen, whether she's 
got assaulted or whether she fell or whether she was in a car wreck. And sometimes the trauma, it doesn't need to be major trauma. Sometimes it can be something simple as maybe tripping on the stairs or something like that and hitting her abdomen. These patients, anytime they come into the ER with abdominal pain and pregnancy, we monitor the fetus and the mom for up to 24 hours and they get an ultrasound just to make sure that this isn't happening because it can cause life-threatening bleeding for the baby and for mom. And it's important to realize you need to have a high degree of suspicion of this because her vital signs are not really going to tell you that she's bleeding until it's almost too late. So remember we talked about them having this massive increase in blood volume. They can lose up to 40% of that blood volume in that intrauterine space before they're going to have a significant change in their vital signs. So just based on your history and your assessment of her, have a high degree of suspicion for abruption. Importantly, as you're transporting these patients who are in the late-term pregnancy, when you transport them, you want to put them on their left side or displace that fetus off of the inferior vena cava. Because if you look here, um, if mom is laying on her back, that baby is compressing the blood flow to the legs coming from the aorta and also the inferior vena cava that's returning blood to the heart. So if you tip her off to the left, it's going to displace the weight of that gravid abdomen and leave room for more blood flow to, to go to and from the lower extremities. Uterine rupture, thank goodness, is an incredibly rare phenomenon, but it's something you need to know about. It tends to occur during labor as that uterus is having really forceful contractions. And risk factors for this are ladies who've had a prior C-section. The thinnest part of the uterus is right down here, right over the pubic symphysis. And that tends to be where ladies have a C-section. So if they've had a C-section before and that thin part of the uterine wall has been cut before, if they haven't formed a really tight scar, what happens is that uterus starts to contract. That uterus can actually rip and tear and the baby can deliver into the abdomen rather than outside the birth canal. Other risk factors for this would be cocaine use, or sometimes it can happen in the hospital when there's a really aggressive induction of labor causing more strong and forceful contractions using medication. This is absolutely a surgical emergency. You need to get this lady to the hospital as fast as possible. I would anticipate her to become pretty unstable, and then it's very rare that the baby survives this emergency. It's going to be incredibly painful for her as well. She'll and you, sometimes you might see through the skin of the abdomen a presenting part of the baby. This is what it looks like here. If the, the lower part of the uterine segment ruptures right here, right over the pubic symphysis, the, the baby can be delivered into the abdomen. Okay, we mentioned before that pregnant females are coagulopathic, so have a high suspicion for pulmonary embolism. They have a tenfold increase in clotting. And this goes up to 12 weeks postpartum. So if you have a lady who's recently delivered and has the right clinical setting with shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, hypoxia, have a high degree of suspicion for PE. This can lead up to 20% of maternal deaths. So it's a very real entity in pregnancy and something to think about. Another thankfully pretty rare phenomenon, but something that does happen and is important to talk about is amniotic fluid embolism. That's where fetal blood enters the maternal circulation for just a small rip or tear in the communication between the two and it causes a profound inflammatory cascade and what that does is it causes pulmonary edema it can lead to heart failure it leads to profound shock and not only that but with this inflammatory cascade just like bad sepsis it can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation where basically there's this imbalance between clotting and bleeding and all of the clotting factors get used up trying to stop little micro hemorrhages and it leads to bleeding everywhere and so this is pretty super high mortality for these ladies thankfully it's very rare but it does happen and it's something that we need to know about another thing that can happen during delivery is peri peripartum cardiomyopathy it usually occurs in the last months of pregnancy and can last up to six months postpartum. Not really clear what exactly happens, but moms will display normal signs of heart failure. So they'll have difficulty laying flat, they'll feel short of breath, they'll have dyspnea on exertion, they'll have maybe peripheral weight gain and edema, cough, just like your normal heart failure patients, which is a little weird because you're seeing it in an otherwise young, healthy female. 
but it is a known entity in pregnancy and is a complication. Typically, it's diagnosed by ultrasound in patients who are exhibiting these signs and symptoms. So one thing to think about if you've got a mom with impending delivery and you're doing your assessment and she feels the need to push and you look and you see a prolapsed cord, this is another emergency we need to be aware of and be ready to treat. So this is where typically it'll be in a lady whose membranes have ruptured too early and the baby is pretty small and the cord can just kind of sneak out around the head. What you want to do here is remember that that cord is that baby's lifeline. So that is the entire blood volume of that baby that's going from mom to baby to give oxygenated blood. So you don't want that thing to become kinked or tamponaded or closed off because that's the blood flow that's going to the baby. So what you do if you see that is you insert two fingers and you try to elevate the presenting part, which is usually the head but might not be. So as you put your fingers inside, what you want to do is on the top of your hand, you want to feel baby's head. And on the back side of your finger here, you want to be able to feel that cord. And you want to be able to feel that cord pulsating and not kinked and doing what it should do. And so you're going to need to leave your fingers in that position until you get to the hospital. And don't be surprised if you need to ride the stretcher all the way to the operating room because this is a surgical emergency and that baby will have to be delivered by C-section. One other thing you can do to just kind of help alleviate the pressure on that cord is to put mom on her hands and knees and kind of use gravity to your advantage here where you're pulling that baby out of the pelvis and more into the abdomen to, to stop that head from pushing on the cord. If you can see here the position that you want her in to tuck that baby in a little bit more into the abdomen and relieve some of that pressure. Now, a breech presentation, there's all different kinds of ways that babies can come out backwards or upside down. Just realize um, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's not a lot we can do in the pre-hospital setting. They need to go to the hospital right away. Let that presenting part just come out. And as the baby is being delivered, what you want to do is grab them by the hips, the bony part of the hips. You don't want to grab by the abdomen because it's really easy to squeeze their spleen and their liver. You want to grab the bony parts and just gently try to guide that baby out. Now, the problem with breech delivery, we talked about earlier how that head being first is an important part of dilating the cervix. And so sometimes in breech deliveries, that cervix is not gonna be completely dilated and the head is the largest part of the body so it can have a hard time getting through that cervix that's not completely open yet. So one thing that you can try to do if baby's body is out is as you put your hands inside and try to deliver the head, you can actually physically put your fingers in the baby's mouth and pull the chin to the chest and that's going to decrease the AP diameter of the head and hopefully be able to squeeze that head out of the cervix that's not completely dilated. That's called the Marisol maneuver. This is probably one of the most common pre-hospital emergencies that you're going to see. It happens not infrequently, especially in this state. It's called shoulder dystocia, and it tends to be with babies that are really large, and it tends to be with moms who have either a history of diabetes or gestational diabetes. I would absolutely know this um, because this is probably the one that you're going to see. And this is a large, usually full-term baby who's so big that their anterior shoulder has a hard time getting past that pubic symphysis there. And so what you're going to do is you'll see the head being delivered, but then past that there's kind of a disruption of labor where it doesn't progress like you think it normally should. And so something that you can do to assist with delivering this baby and getting this large baby out of a smaller pelvis would be something called the McRoberts position, where if you have extra hands on scene, you want to pull mom's knees back towards her shoulder as far as she can tolerate. And what that's going to do is open that pelvis, shorten the birth canal, and help deliver this large baby. The other thing that you can do, in addition to McRoberts, which can make a really big difference, is suprapubic pressure. Now it's important here that you're not pressing on the uterus, you're pressing right over that pubic symphysis. And if you see here, what you're doing is trying to collapse that shoulder and shrink the AP diameter of that chest. So you're pushing, pushing on baby's shoulder, trying to help it get past, get past that bony structure there so it can deliver with the rest of the body. Don't push on the uterus, push right over that bone and try to collapse that shoulder.
after baby's out, um, don't forget that the placenta needs to deliver. You want to clamp and cut the cord just like usual. Don't pull on the placenta. It can take up to 30 minutes to deliver. That's fine. Um, mom's going to tell you that she feels another contraction and she'll be able to tell you. Um, what you can watch for externally is you'll see the cord start to lengthen, maybe a couple centimeters, and then there's just a small rush of blood, maybe maybe a couple teaspoons, and then she'll tell you she feels a contraction and it'll start to give way. As the placenta delivers, you want to gently just pull slow, gentle traction and kind of twist and pull as the rest of it delivers. Make sure that you're saving it in a bag. It's going to be important to assess that the placenta is intact and all the parts and pieces are out. If there's any retained pieces of the placenta, that can lead to a pretty significant postpartum hemorrhage. So you want to save that placenta, take it to the hospital. They're going to want to see it. And then just monitor mom for continued bleeding. Postpartum hemorrhage is a really real consideration after baby's delivered. It's defined as greater than 500 milliliters of blood loss. I remember things to think about when you've got a lady who's just delivered and she's bleeding more than you'd like her to. There's four T's here. Tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. So tone by far is the number one problem with postpartum hemorrhage and that's just a uterus that hasn't contracted down yet. So what you want to do is massage that uterus, stimulate it so that it will contract down. And one thing you can do here, if baby is vigorous and mom is feeling okay, you could try to have baby breastfeed right away. That's going to increase the release of oxytocin to her brain, which is essentially a chemical that's going to help that uterus contract down. Trauma is another thing to think about. You're not really going to have a lot of control here in terms of what you can repair, but it's something to think about as a possible cause of bleeding if she has torn her cervix or had any tissue trauma as that baby's delivered, especially with larger babies, that can absolutely happen and cause a significant amount of bleeding. Tissue is something we mentioned with the placenta. So if there's piece, if the placenta tears or there's pieces of tissue that are left, that's going to make it hard for the uterus to contract down all the way and can cause continued bleeding after delivery. And then thrombin. We talked about amniotic fluid embolism, but for some reason in a rare a very small percentage of pregnancies, ladies have a hard time just clotting after pregnancy and they can go into DIC. So if you have a lady that's bleeding, recognize the bleeding, continually assess the bleeding, make sure you've got large bore IVs available, give fluid, uh, try your uterine massage and encourage that breastfeeding to use the hormones to your advantage. And that's all I've got. If you have any questions, let me know or talk to your 7-8.